answering that same question with a good look at what's happening in Norway, because you're one of the countries I think is going to have a financial crisis uh, probably in the next year or so. So uh, <laughs> they're very, very popular. But of course, economists warned very clearly that there was going to be a crisis back in 2008. If you go back and take a look at what they wrote in 2007, there was ample warming they gave then to, econ to politicians around the world about an approaching crisis. This is the OECD in June. Now, the crisis is normally regarded as having started in, in August 9 of 2007 because on that particular day, the BNP, Bank National Paris, shut down three of its funds saying it was no liquidity in the market. They simply couldn't price these derivatives and they were just basically cancelling, not allowing redemptions effectively, which put a panic through the market and that's taken as the beginning. This was published about 10 weeks before that happened. Our current economic situation is in many ways better than we've experienced in years. Our outlook looks quite, our forecast is quite benign. Now imagine you're a politician taking this stuff seriously. You're relying upon the experts. This is what the experts are telling you. And they say there's going to be strong job creation and falling unemployment in the middle of 2007. At the time they said it, the unemployment rate in America was already rising. And within, a, within two, one and a half years was twice its level at that time and the highest it had been since 1990. And if you look at the, the data and, and revise the way unemployment was defined to make it consistent with how it was defined before 1990, then it was the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. And it was a very, very sudden downturn. Now even after the crisis began, so by, by December they knew there was something bad happening in the markets. And this is the Federal Open Monetary Committee uh, for the policy group that sets interest rates in the Federal Reserve. And this is a, uh, a speech by David Stockton, who is their chief research economist, still being paid very well to be a research economist somewhere else in the world, I think. Same story. Four months after the crisis starts, a pretty benign picture. Despite all the financial turmoil, the economy avoids recession. Now, he wasn't to know it at the time he said that, but the point he said the economy avoided recession is the month that the and National Bureau of Economic uh, Research now regards as a recession having started. Okay. So that's just how totally misleading conventional economists were. And the real question is how could they miss the biggest event since the Great Depression? If they're supposed to be experts on the economy, how on earth did they miss that biggest crisis? Well, if you look at their, the, the reasoning that they have about the economy has two, more than two, but I see two to me really fundamental flaws. And one is they imagine an economy in which money doesn't matter. Okay. Now, if you reckon money doesn't matter, and credit doesn't matter, and debt doesn't matter, you're not looking at what caused the crisis. Okay. Completely orthogonal to what actually caused the crisis. But this is Paul Krugman, who is probably the most vociferous defender of the mainstream way of thinking, uh, sort of progressive end of the mainstream way of thinking uh, in, in economics. And he's criticising here Richard Koo, who's one of the people who, to some extent, warned of the Japanese crisis before it began, began and had an explanation based on balance sheets, credit, debt, financial transactions and so on. And here is Krugman deriding Ku and saying, well, your, his argument makes no sense because what he's saying is that uh, an entire economy can be balance sheet constrained. So an entire economy can have too much debt to be able to function. And he's saying it doesn't make any sense at all because where there are debtors, there must be creditors. And that's basically simply the truism that if something is an asset for somebody, it is normally, 99.9% .9 of the time, a liability for somebody else. Okay. When you're talking in a monetary system, there are some things like gold, um, your own house, physical things of that nature, which are your individual asset. But when you're talking monetary assets, if you have a debt, that's your, your asset, it's somebody else's liability. So that's a truism. But he's saying because of that truism, uh, there must be some people who can respond to low interest rates. And therefore, the system should balance out overall. And then continuing the same argument, he said the overall level of debt makes no difference to aggregate net worth. Again, because of this one person's liability being another person's asset. He says it follows that the level of debt matters only if the distribution matters. In other words, you can ignore the aggregate level of private debt. All that matters is if the people who are in debt are constrained in some ways, the people who are not in debt are not constrained and therefore there's some differentiation between two different groups. And the reason that he has that belief is he is based on what I'm frankly going to call a childish model of banks, where banks are described as being intermediaries. Who's doing an economics degree? I have someone here, by the way, in the audience. Quite a few. So you've got that idea of banks as intermediaries. You've heard that one 
Okay, they're not. Okay? They're originators. They do not intermediate between borrowers and savers. They create loans and they create money in the process. And I've been part of a group of renegade economists arguing this on empirical research and the practical reality of how, how banks operate for 50 years or so. And we've been ignored by the mainstream. But fortunately, now finally, central banks are coming out on our side. So I'm going to give you that in a moment. But here is a model by Krugman with, with, a, with a co-worker and an appendix to a technical paper that was, uh, that was uh, tried to explain that there was an explanation for a crisis given the two different classes, constrained borrowers and unconstrained lenders. But this is at the back of their little paper. They had a model saying banks accept deposits and lend them. So it's the whole idea of intermediaries. You take a deposit from somebody, you lend it to somebody else, and you then charge a fee for the service. I call that the Ashley Madison theory of banking, if anybody knows what Ashley Madison is supposed to do. Okay? Um, I think it's actually banks more like the Red Flag District than Ashley Madison, as I'll go on to in a moment. And then on this basis, and, and, and again, people think there's sophisticated ideas behind economic models they don't understand. If you look at them, you'll find half the time there's childish notions dressed up in uh, slightly com complicated mathematics. So what's going on here is they have a bank as the life of a single loan contract. And the loan, by the way, is, an, is a, I think it's an indestructible commodity. It's not actually money as we know it. This is the so-called sophisticated model behind their argument. Now, we've been arguing this sort of stuff as nonsense for five, 50 years or more. But we've been ignored because we're, we're just not orthodox economists. Who cares what we think? We're outside the mainstream. We must be the cranks and the ones who get the Nobel Prizes must be the experts. But central banks believe that as well. And they walk right into the financial crisis. And unlike academic economists who can sit back in their rooms and, and continue writing their papers and continue spouting the same old textbook theories without any real challenge from the real world, people who are taking this stuff seriously and building models of it in central banks and presenting those models to politicians and saying this is our forecast for the economy set those politicians up for walking into nightmares of press conferences you said the economy is going to boom it's a crash etc etc so the central banks i think are more reactive to what actually happened politically than the academic departments are by far and one by one they're starting to come out and say look the mainstream model is nonsense that is not how the real world operates so the very first bank to do that and by the way, what, what, what they're saying is the idea that there's a money multiplier, if you know that one from your economics, for those who have been doing that. Or if you've heard of fractional reserve banking, you all heard of it? It doesn't exist. Okay? It's a stupid model of the real world. It's like Ptolemy cycles. Have you all heard of Ptolemy and Epi cycles? They don't exist either. But they fitted the data for planetary motion for one and a half millennia. And people believe they're actually up there in the sky. They weren't. The same thing applies to fractional reserve banking. It's a mythical model that appears to fit the data but doesn't actually explain what happens. And now, rather than me having to say it, I can now quote the Bank of England. This happened in 2014, early in the year, saying rather than banks receiving deposits and lending them out, which is the intermediary's role, bank lending creates deposits. I could have almost fallen. I mean, Bank of England, I had some awareness that this was going to happen because I knew the people in the bank were being influenced by the work that I was doing and others were doing in non-orthodox economics. They were inviting us in for seminars, a very, very open institution and really wanting to learn and, and try to find a way that actually matched the data. Blow me over there when the Bundesbank came out and said the same thing. This is six weeks ago or eight weeks ago. The Bundesbank published a paper saying, this refutes a popular misconception that banks act, sim act simply as intermediaries at the time of lending. Now, that normally when you talk about a popular misconception, it's something that the public believes that the experts know is false. Okay? This is one of the things which the public generally doesn't believe that the experts believe is true. Okay? It's the inverse. It's actually the so-called experts who are wrong here. The popular misconception is held by the so-called experts academic economists, not by the public in general. And now, hooray, hooray, Bank of Norway has also joined the phrase. This is a very recent statement by one of your uh, bank uh, deputy governors, and I'm, again, great, my, my great gratitude. This is finally being said by central banks to give the non-orthodox side, which is correct, the authority of the central banks to oppose the authority so-called of the academic economists. The bank has not transferred the money from someone else's bank account 
or from a vault full of money. The money lent to you by the bank has been created by the bank itself out of nothing. So this is now finally becoming accepted as the real world and we've got to fight the academic economists to get this stuff on the textbooks. I reckon it'll take 15 to 20 years. No, in the, that's if we're lucky. That's only if we don't die beforehand, okay? Uh, they, would, they would want to stick to these models to fight the fact that they're completely unrealistic. Now, what they're doing in appearing to be the authorities, and here I really relate them to, I used an example of Ptolemy's epicycles a short while ago. It's almost like they are Ptolemaic astronomers in the age of Copernicus, hanging on to a vision that fitted the data, but is completely wrong, against observations to say that the model doesn't work, the structure must be completely different. So what you see them doing is building models of the economy that assume the economy either is in or always near equilibrium. And if it's disturbed from equilibrium, it will return back to equilibrium very rapidly. And they have barter models. They don't actually have money, banks or debt in any serious sense inside their models at all. So with, without the economy always being in equilibrium or going to return to it at any particular time, and with, uh, with no money to worry about, any crisis has to be an accident. We have to be hit by a meteor. So here's um, Chris Giles, who's one of the rather conservative English economists, citing a member of the Mon Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, lashing out against criticisms of economics. And he says, any criticism of economics that rests on its failure to predict a financial crisis is no more plausible than the idea that mathematicians can be criticised because they can't predict the winning lotto numbers next week. In other words, saying that, that, that is arguing that crisis is an exogenous shock. Now, think about it. How on earth can you regard the financial sector, which they admit was the source of the crisis, how can you regard that as exogenous to the economy? It's a particular mental leap, isn't it, to imagine the financial sector as exogenous to the economy, but they do. So what I've done, partly to show why these um, arguments don't work, is I've taken the model that uh, Krugman and Eggertson and co. put together, where banks are just intermediaries, and put it into a software package that... Uh, uh, I've designed, which is, uh, this is why Trin and I get on, we, uh, system, it's, this is what's called a system dynamics model, the model of the economy. And what it adds to packages that engineers use is banking, as a, as a way of modelling the banking sector. And what I've done here is I've modelled the world as if the consumer's a good sector here, so just highlight that, that's the consumer goods sector, it's looking at the financial system from the point of view for the consumer sector, and the consumer sector is lending money to the investment sector. So therefore, the debt is an asset of the consumer sector and a liability of the investment sector. And therefore, what happens is the consumer sector lends to the investment sector, the investment sector repays, the investment sector pays interest payments to the consumer sector, and the bank gets paid a bank fee. This is the Ashley Madison theory of banking. Now, if you set it up, and I've got it in a very simple model where there's workers are hard to produce output, output, pardon me, um, each, each sector buys goods from each other and so on. Uh, if I run this model and simulate it, and I change the rate of rent lending to make lending happen more rapidly, notice the growth rate actually dipped when I increase the uh, rate of lending. The growth rate is this bit here. Notice it's normally zero, and GDP is flatlining at 200. And over here I'm controlling how fast lending happens, so the smaller the number, the faster lending happens, and this controls repayment. So the smaller the number, the faster repayment uh, occurs. And down here, I've got the ratio of debt to GDP. I hope you can see all those on. Yeah, you could. Great. OK. New technology, by the way. Uh, let's continue running that model. Oh, new technology, and it's frozen on me. Great. Let's try again. OK. So if I now slow down repayments, so repayment, take, repayment takes a long time, then the debt ratio rises, as you can see. But there's no change in the amount of money in the economy. Very little change to the growth rate. And if I then have repayment happen, happening much more quickly, the growth rate actually accelerates and lending much more slowly, same thing. So the debt ratio has risen and fallen dramatically and there's been no, no lasting impact on the rate of economic growth or the level of economic activity. So in that structural sense, if they were structurally right about how the economy operates, you could ignore bank debt and money and macroeconomics. 
Now, as I've said, I've, I've developed this software package so I could actually analyze arguments like that. So what I can do is go inside the software package and I can delete, this is called Minsky by the way, this is the t-shirt for it as well. I can delete the showing that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector and delete financial transactions being shown between the um, consumer sector and the investment sector, come over to the banking sector, add in an additional asset, and when I click on this down arrow here, it shows me that debt is still a liability of somebody in the system, is still a liability of the investment sector, but it isn't yet shown as an asset to anybody else. So I can choose it as an asset, and Minsky then brings across all the operations that were there. All I have to do is say, well, the interest payments are actually made to the bank rather than being made to the consumer sector, and I can get rid of that silly bank fee. I know banks charge fees, but it's not the main way they make money. So having done that, I can go back and reset the system now, go back to the initial situation where there was lending, doubling the amount, number of loans every seven years and repayment, halving loans every nine years, roughly. Obviously, I could, I could do this in 30 seconds if I wasn't trying to talk over the top and show you what I'm doing. But having done that, now we run the system again, and all I've done is say banks lend money. Okay, I've got exactly the same structure for the model apart from that. It's the only thing I've changed. Rather than banks being intermediaries, they now originate money and debt. So I run the system now, and there's a positive growth rate for a start. GDP is growing over time. As debt grows, the money stock grows. And if I increase the rate of lending, the growth rate accelerates. Slow down repayment, the same story, growth gets higher. And then if there's a decline, an increase in how fast people repay debt, and a slowdown in how fast banks lend money, you have a slump. That's all it takes to illustrate the impact of them being wrong and then changing over to the real world where banks actually lend, create money, and don't just create money, they create demand at the same time. And when you repay debt, you destroy money and destroy demand. So you've got to keep your eye on the financial system. If you take it off, as the main, mainstream does, you don't see the real world. So that's, that's how profoundly important this is. They tend to dismiss anybody who argues about the importance of money and they call us money mystics <coughs> and put down terms like that. If I was a money mystic and it was all smoke and mirrors, you wouldn't have seen the thing I just showed you. Okay. So it's the mainstream that's got the smoke and mirrors confusing us about the nature of the banking system. And I now just refer to this as being bank originated money and debt. So banks originate money and originate debt simultaneously. They've got the capacity to create money just because they have a banking licence. And that lets them do double entry bookkeeping and create money for you and assets for them, which are claims upon your, your income stream in the future. Now, once you've done that, you've now got the capacity to understand where the economy gets its cycles from, its crises from. But you've got to go one step further again, because what, I've, what I showed you a moment ago was a, effectively what's called a linear model. There was no feedback between the level of economic activity and wages, which therefore meant there was no change in income distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So that model could go on forever without having a crisis. So what I've done, and this has worked with where the word name Harman Minsky comes in, I've taken Harman Minsky's theory and started from a, a model of a cyclical economy. And this is a, a model done of the economy where I have just used definitions of the employment rate and the wage share of income, made them into dynamic models by differentiating with respect to time and put in the simplest possible definitions of the relationships between <laughs> wages and employment and so on. And when I simulate this model, I get cycles, but I don't get a breakdown. So the system is unstable, but it doesn't give you a breakdown. But when I add in debt, and this is again why, why money matters so much, if I add in debt as one of my definitions, I have the debt to GDP ratio inside there, then I get a world that does this. And I'll show you the, the crisis setting for the model and this is something I first saw when I was doing my PhD back in 1992. Unfortunately, put in an intentional error, that's better, okay. And what I got out of this model was what looked like cycles that were diminishing. You'll notice the employment cycle there gets smaller. Notice the wage share is falling and there's a rising level of private debt to GDP. But after a while, those cycles start to get bigger again. So there's a period of what you might call the Great Moderation preceding a crisis. And that's something I predicted in 1992. 
I didn't expect it to happen, frankly, because I thought my model was too simple. But in fact, by being simple, the model actually captured the basics, one of the basic elements of the capitalist system, this tendency to have crises, and the crisis is preceded by an apparent moderation in the crisis. So credit matters. You've got to look at the, look at the monetary system to explain where you are. And one of the reasons that it's taken a long time for economists of any description to get their heads around the role of credit in macroeconomics is because we have this identity as well, which is absolutely true, and that's expenditure is income. Your spending becomes somebody else's income. Now, not being aware of that leads to a whole lot of fallacies which get in the way of thinking about the economy, one of them being we should all save money. And I want to show you why that's wrong in a moment. Because what you're saving is somebody else's drop in income. If you're going to spend less, you're generating less income for somebody else. So your spending is exactly equal to somebody else's fallen income. Which is why saving is not actually a good idea. I'll show you the logic of that behind that in a moment. So uh, the, this expenditure is income also got in the way of understanding what, what role does credit have in that? Because if you say expenditure is income, it looks like saying, well, you, income is income is expenditure, and therefore income is the only source of demand, that there's no role for credit. That type of thinking got caught up in the non-mainstream economists as well. What I've argued and proven, and I think I'll show you the proof of that in this talk, is that there are two sources of expenditure. Expenditure drives income. Somebody has to spend before you get an income, so expenditure is in the driver's seat. And there's two sources of spending, and you can think about it your own, yourself personally. There's either Turnover of existing money, so you spend something in your savings account or some cash in your pocket. Or you borrow money from the bank. You swipe your credit card to pay for something or you take out a home loan. And when you do that and you spend the money, you create expenditure and income for somebody else. Now, because most of the borrowing we do is to buy assets, and that certainly applies in Norway. Yes, you have a housing bubble. Okay. Um, because it mainly is used to buy assets rather than buy goods and services, you can roughly measure the sum of the two by adding GDP to credit. There is a bit of a, a double counting going on there because some borrowed money is used to, to buy goods and services, whether that's consumer purchases or investment and so on, but it gives you a good idea. And then what you find is the ups and downs of credit, as I've shown you in that model, explain the ups and downs in the real world as well. And if you leave them out of your model, you're not, you're not going to understand crises at all, but if you put them in, you can see whether a crisis is inevitable. You can't time them because you have to time when people are going to stop borrowing money or when banks are going to get worried and stop lending. That's, but you can say when it's likely to happen in the foreseeable future, which is what I'll be talking about here. And one of the dangers as well, one of the reasons it's so hard to fight against a credit bubble is while the credit bubble is going on, everybody's happy. The person who's spending is getting more commodities or whatever they're getting because they're borrowing money to get them. The people they're spending money on are getting either income or capital gain uh, it's very, very difficult to say, well, this is a bad idea if you sustain it at these levels. That's one of the great dangers. So I want to show you now that relationship of taking GDP, adding credit to GDP, and then looking at when the crisis occurs. So the, on this graph, the, um, the red line is GDP. The blue line is GDP plus credit, involving some double counting, but not, not a lot. And the black line, which is graphed against the right-hand axis, is credit as a percentage of GDP. So you're looking at the American situation here. Right from 1960 all the way through, credit was positive. There was no period of negative credit. Then you had the global financial crisis. Credit went from 15% of GDP to minus 5% in a couple of years, and then recovered. So you've now got rising credit once more. And you notice that turning point up there, you pretty much identify where the crisis began. So it's a very powerful way of working out what's going to happen to your economy. Now, I'm starting to live in the UK these days, and the UK had the ridiculous uh, political situation of conservatives blaming the crisis on government spending by the Labor Party when they were in power. But it was exactly the same story. They had a huge credit bubble, bigger than the Americans. Credit was about 20% of GDP. It then plunged about minus five. It's been up and down for quite some time. The recovery that they had recently, which is now starting to terminate, was due to a revival of credit. Okay. The Conservatives can't, will take credit for it, but it, again, it wasn't what they did, it was the, the credit system. What about Norway? Well, to some extent you might say crisis, what crisis, given your level of unemployment? But you've had the same basic dynamics. So this is now your, your data. 
and the credit bubble in, in Norway was substantially higher than America or the UK. Credit at one stage in 2009 or 10, I think, or 2008, I think that is, peaked at 35% of GDP. Huge expansion in demand. Then, then down to minus, what's that there? It's minus, almost minus 10%. You're now back in positive credit again, but it's trending down, which is why I'm saying I think the timing is pretty close that you're going to have a crisis when that goes from a positive credit to negative credit. Now, we've ignored all this stuff, but it's been really what drove the apparent success of neoliberalism. The neoliberal period didn't work because capitalists were better managers if they didn't have to worry about trade unions, etc., etc. It worked because they borrowed a fortune from the banking sector and spent it. And it looked like they knew that they were doing because of that uh, demand from borrowed money. And again, putting Norway in context here, America's level of private debt peaked at uh, 170% of GDP, the UK peaked at 295% of GDP, you hit 225% in the, the, the crisis, dipped a bit, and you're now up to almost 250% of GDP. So on this basis, you're the third most indebted, on, in the database the Bank of International Settlements has, which is about 45 countries now, and it's most of the world's major economies, you're the third most indebted on the planet. The only two more indebted than you are Hong Kong and Denmark. You might take some pleasure in Denmark being one of them, but actually not Denmark. Is it Denmark? No, Hong Kong and uh, Switzerland. So no particular schadenfreude there, is there? Okay, okay. Now, now why do you get it? You need to have both high debt and high credit. So a high level of debt and a high rate of change of debt to get a crisis. And I define credit as the annual change in debt. That's all my measurements in economics come down to be dimensioned by, by time and the time unit is a year. So I look at change in debt per year as credit. And the reason that you have a crisis is that you don't even have to have credit turning negative. You can have a crisis when the rate of growth of credit slows down to being the same as GDP. So even if you stabilise the debt ratio, you'll have a crisis because that will cause a fall in demand. And that's because of this basic rule that aggregate demand is roughly... GDP plus credit, if you can separate out the turnover of existing money, it is precisely turnover of existing money plus credit. And I'll give you, if you have an economy which has a low level of debt, imagine an economy where the GDP is a thousand trillion dollars per year and it's growing at 10% per year and that's a pretty reasonable level of figures for the last two or three decades. And private debt is 50% of GDP in that economy. In that case, therefore, it starts at 500 billion dollars, which is 50% of GDP. And it's growing at 20% per annum. And again, that's a fairly realistic rate of growth. As I showed you, Norway had a rate of growth of 35% of GDP just a short while ago. Well, if credit grows by 20% in a year and it starts at 500 billion, it'll be, there'll be a $100 billion increase in, in debt that year. So credit of $100 billion. You add the two together to get total demand, it's 1.1 trillion. Now imagine that next year the GDP continues growing at the same rate. So you get a turnover of existing money of 1.1 trillion, but the growth of debt slows down to growing at the same speed as debt. So it's not the same speed as the GDP. So it's not falling, it, it's just growing at the, no faster than GDP. Well, 10% of 600 billion is $60 billion. So you add the two together and you get a total demand of 1.16 trillion. So that's $60 billion higher than the year before. So you, you had an increase in demand even though credit slowed down. What about if you look at the level of debt we have now, where it's in Norway's place more than twice GDP? So imagine an economy, same basic condition, but the private debt level is 200% of GDP. In that case, that would be $2 trillion worth of debt, and 20% of that is credit growth in the uh, debt growth in the first year, which is credit in the first year, is $400 billion. That gives you a total amount of $1.4 trillion. Now that looks like a booming economy compared to the other one. Okay, which is one reason why credit is such a, a seductive and dangerous thing to have in your economy. Next year, GDP is 1.1 trillion, same as the other example. Growth of debt slows to 10%, but 10% of 2.4 trillion dollars is 240 billion, which is, as you can see, 160 billion less than the previous year. You add that 240 billion to the 1.1 trillion dollars worth of GDP, and you find total turnover is 1.34 trillion, $60 billion less than the year before. So you don't even have to have debt to go negative. All that has to do is slow down and you can have a crisis. 
And that's why the level of debt and the rate of growth of debt both matter. So that's... I'm going to come back to this theme in a moment when I talk about Norway's situation now. But one reaction which you're going to get in this economy, for sure, is some politician will say, look at the increasing level of government debt now when the crisis strikes, we should run austerity. That's what well, the UK has been doing to itself for the last 10 years. And the idea is it's a good idea for government to save money. This is the whole saving money idea. So I want to take a look at that. And if you look, of course, at, uh, by the way, uh, Troy and I know uh, very vividly took part in the anti-EU campaign here. I just remember an extremely uh, euphoric photograph of him uh, cheering the fact that you voted against during the Euro. One of the best decisions you ever made. Possibly almost as good as finding North Sea oil. Okay. <laughs> But the Stability and Growth Pact says that the member states undertake to abide by the medium-term budgetary objectives of positions close to balance or in surplus. So the idea of the EU was the government should normally run a surplus. That's the objective. This is the, the Schwabian housewife vision that you will hear Germans talk about. And it sounds sensible. Let's save money. We all save money. We're saving for a rainy day. You know that expression? Okay. You must know that expression. You're in Norway. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to imagine a little uh, monetary union called Tom, Dick, Harry. And this is the three American Republicans, Tom, Dick and Harry. And they aren't there bright, all that bright on their own. You know, the old expression, <laughs> any Tom, Dick and Harry can understand that. Uh, but they get together, they can work anything out. This is actually the basis of a cartoon I'm writing with a good friend, Miguel Aguirre, who's a brilliant cartoonist, to try to get this idea at a level that politicians can understand. Uh, and they look at the data and Tom, Dick and Harry work out the government's never going to run a surplus because they, they find they can actually go to the American uh, Federal Reserve database so called, called FRED and find the average surplus for the American economy for the last one and a half, one and a quarter centuries. This data goes right back to 1901. And you, it's pretty hard to see. I'll just make it a bit, large, a bit larger there. That's zero, the dotted line there. Down here is the average surplus, which has actually been a deficit, pardon me, of 2.4% of GDP. So there's been one period, notice here, this is a period where they managed to run a surplus, 1920 to 1930. What happened after that? And here's Clinton's surplus, 2000. What happened after that? Okay. But Tom and Dick and Harry ignore that bit. All they notice is they claim they want to run a surplus, and they normally fail. Normally they're below that line. So you look along most of the time in the 1950, 1950s on, the government ran a deficit. And the average was 2.4% for the entire last 120 years. And after World War II, leading out, because obviously World War II caused a huge deficit. At one stage, level of government deficit in one year was 25% of GDP. Okay? But I'm leaving that out, just starting from the post-war period. It still was running a deficit on average of 2% of GDP. So Tom, Dick and Harry decide, well, they're never going to do it themselves. We're going to form our own little country called Tom, Dick, Harry, self-sufficient, and we're going to show them how to save money. So they start with $100 each. So the total money supply is $300. And they each spend $100 each year on each other. So Tom spends $100 on Dick and Harry each. Dick can spends $100 on Tom and $100 on Harry, etc., etc. As I've said, expenditure is income. Total income, therefore, is $600 dollars a year. And the way you can work this out is by adding up the, the, this is a little table showing what Tom spends on Dick and Harry, what Dick spends on Tom and Harry, what Harry spends on Tom and Dick. And, you know, it all sounds great, doesn't you say it too quickly? Okay. And that's Tom spending, that's Dick spending, and that's Harry spending. The total sum of that is the GDP measured by expenditure, $600 a year. You measure the income, $100 for each of Dick and Harry coming from Tom, $100 from each of Harry and uh, Tom and Harry coming from Dick, etc., etc. So the off diagonals of the income measure of GDP they are necessarily identical. Okay. Now, when you add them up, add up the horizontal, uh, the, the diagonal, you get the G, you get the expenditure measure of GDP. Add up the <coughs> off diagonal, you get the income measure. They are necessarily the same, and nobody's saving any money right now. So Tom decides he's going to be the brave one. He might be the miser of the group. He's going to be the one who saves money first of all. Now, aggregate saving starts at zero. Okay. So Tom decides he's going to run a budget surplus of 5% of his GDP per year, which is $10. His GDP is 200, so 5% of that is $10. 
How does he do it? He spends ten dollars, five dollars less on each of Dick and Harry. Now, by having done that, he spends. He's spending one hundred and ninety. He's still getting income of two hundred, but they haven't changed their behaviour. He saves ten. Success. Only Dick and Harry have now got five dollars each of less income coming in. Their saving now becomes minus five, and that wasn't their decision. Okay, their this saving was caused by Harry's decision to save. So take a look at the total situation there. Tom's now saved his 10. Aggregate GDP has now fallen by $10, exactly as much as Tom has saved. It's caused, in other words, his saving has caused a fall in GDP, and aggregate savings is still zero. Now, what did Dick and Harry do? Well, they think we've got to restore ourselves back to balance. We're $5 in the, in the red. We're going to reduce our spending by $5. Okay, so they do that. So rather than spending $100 on the other two, they spend 97.5 on the other two, and they only get halfway to their target. They've now reduced, they didn't mean to do it, they didn't do it for this reason, obviously, but they've reduced Tom's surplus to five, and their deficits haven't fallen from five to zero, they've fallen from five to minus 2.5. They're still in the red. Aggregate GDP is now 580, fallen another 10. They've all failed to meet their savings targets and aggregate savings are still zero. So Tom, having gone from five to ten and wants to have ten, he's going to get back there in a hurry. He's going to save another ten dollars. And Dick and Harry think, well, we've got to reduce that five as well. Now, because Tom does a double whammy there, he's now spending 90 on each of them. They're still spending 95 on him and each other. So he comes, Tom gets back to his $10 surplus again. The other two are back in minus five territory. So Tom's got his surplus back. Aggregate GDP is now fallen by another $20. Savings is caused a falling in GDP and aggregate savings is still zero. So Dick and Harry think we're gonna overshoot. We didn't get there, we've tried five last time, they didn't work, we're gonna cut by 10 this time. So they do that. And we're now back in balance again. Notice what's happened to GDP. It's fallen by $60 per year. And aggregate savings are still zero. You can't save money into existence. But that's what we're trying to do by austerity. What it simply does is your money turns over more slowly, you create less money, your GDP falls. It's the stupidest idea on the planet. It sounds sensible because people haven't thought through the consequences. That's a simple little numerical example. And I can extend it by including banks being in the system and government and so on. But the idea of austerity is an incredibly bad idea. Don't let your politicians talk you into it. They're bound to try because they still have that Schwabian housewife vision of how the economy operates. So, you know, the end, end result of that process, in fact, is a GDP of zero. And that's the direction in which Greece is being driven right now by the European Union. So it's possible for individuals to save. It's not possible for economies to save. If you're going to have more money in the aggregate saved, you've got to create more money. So the question comes down to how do you create money? How do you make money? Now, it's far easier than you all think. You don't have to go work for a living. You just have to get a banking licence. Because okay? you cannot make money. You might be able to make a profit. You might earn a wage. You don't make money. If you do make money, there'll be a policeman knocking in your door at some stage because you're counterfeiting. So making money is something that's reserved for three groups. Banks create money by creating more new loans than they get back in repayments of old loans. And I call, that's why I call this bank originated money and debt or bond, which I think is a good acronym to explain what happens with this when you let it get out of control. Now, when that bank lending occurs, the person who gets the money also gets an identical liability. So that money comes with a matching liability. There is no increase in the aggregate assets of that person. They have money to spend, but they've got a liability equivalent to the amount of money they've been given. Governments create money by spending more than they get back in taxation. And so long as you have your own currency, and thank God you have the krona, okay. you can create money by the government spending more than it gets back in taxation. There's no limit on the government doing that in a practical sense. There is limits on what the impact might be on the economy, but there's no practical limit on it doing that. And when the government creates money, it doesn't come with a liability for the recipient. If somebody's paid a dole check, they don't get a debt to the government to pay that money back at a later stage. I'm sure some conservative politician would think that's a good idea, okay, but the government money comes without a liability attached to it. Now, the surplus objective actually makes that negative. 
So the whole idea of a government running a surplus is actually a government deciding to destroy money. That's the way to think about it. That's the way to argue with your friends before it happens. And please start doing it before it happens because it will happen. Okay? You're going to have a financial crisis. The politicians will argue for austerity and they'll say we should run a government surplus. If the public realises that's stupid before it happens, there's much more chance of preventing it than if it happens otherwise. Now, a third way to create money is to export more than you import. The reason being, if you export Norwegian oil and you sell it in US dollars, then the company selling that oil as US dollars bring those US dollars to their bank, deposit it to the bank, the bank then transfers it to the central bank, the central bank then takes in those foreign exchange reserves, the dollars, and credits your, your, the seller's bank account with krona. That's another way of creating money. And the trade surplus you've got, and Germany has, and Netherlands, and China, and uh, Japan, and so on, mean effectively that outsource money creation to the rest of the world. So the only successful basis for running a surplus in that case in any way is mercantilism. And that happens to be what your economy is practicing. You are mercantilists. Um, much better justification, I think, than some of the countries that have done that. But this is looking at uh, your credit bubble now and showing you the scale of your credit bubble. So you had a bigger credit bubble than America or England. Why did you not have a crisis on the same scale? The reason is because you have this enormous current, sur current account surplus. The US and the UK are both running deficits. Norway's current account surplus was as high as 20% of GDP. And of course, with the fall in the oil price, it's a lot lower now. But that has given you a capacity to carry a higher level of private debt than other companies, <coughs> countries can have. The trouble is you've done it. You would have been much better off if you hadn't borrowed that private money. You would have much lower house prices and you'd have much more of your wealth which would be directed to your sovereign wealth fund rather than to asset speculation on housing. Uh, now, just looking at which is bigger, the credit side of your economy or the current account side, and unfortunately, the credit side is bigger. The red line is credit as a percentage of GDP, change in debt per year, and as you can see, that's way up here at a peak at 35%, just after the financial crisis. The biggest you've got is 20% for the current account surplus. So, even though you have been running a very successful mercantilist policy, the level of credit's been larger than that. So you, you're setting yourself up for a trap, which you are now about to fall into, in my opinion. So when you look at the relationship, and I want to show why credit matters, if you're looking at a straight relationship with economic uh, data, this is looking at credit and unemployment. Now, according to the mainstream, there should be no relationship between the two. In fact, when you borrow money and you spend it into existence, you add to its demand and you can therefore employ more people. So when credit grows, unemployment falls and vice versa. And the correlation there from 1990 till now is 0.68. It's supposed to be zero according to conventional economic theory. They don't bother checking to see whether they're right or not. They assume they're right and don't look at the data. You know, but this is the actual data. Uh, the current account weakens that dependence because the same sort of thing applies with the current account. As that grows, your unemployment will fall. Um, it's not as strong a relationship as for credit, but it does give you a buffer, which other countries don't have. So I do want to emphasise your economy is not going to be in as bad a situation as America was or I mean, England, England was, because you do have that other positive cash drain coming in. But of course, with falling oil prices, you may get a double whammy. You might find your current account falls at the same time as you have a collapse in credit. I think there's fairly good odds of that happening in the next year. So looking at your debt bubble in reference to the rest of the world, also I forget that Ireland. Ireland has a bigger level of private debt than you do, but the Irish data looks like it was designed by a leprechaun, so I don't take it too seriously. <laughs> um, but there's, there, as you can see, Norway up at 2.45 times GDP. Uh, that's well above ch uh, Canada. It's well above Australia. It's well above China. And this is just for reference to Japan and the USA, which are what I call the walking dead of debt. They've already had their crisis. You guys are amongst the zombies to be. Now, most of your debt, again, this is rather different in Norway, most of your debt's in the corporate sector. So in most countries, when I graph this, the blue line, which is household debt, is above the red line, which is corporate. In your case, most of your debt is corporate debt, and that's actually better in a lot of ways because corporations are allowed to go bankrupt. You know, nobody, you can't pursue a company after it's gone bankrupt because it doesn't exist anymore but people chase households forever. Okay? The household continues to exist even after it goes bankrupt. So it's easier to write off corporate debt than private debt.
But of course, what the politicians are going to obsess about is this thing down here, government debt. That's going to go north. That's going to increase drastically when you have a slowdown because tax revenue will fall and that welfare right payments will rise. So government spending will rise in the aftermath of the crisis, but the politicians, particularly the opposition, whoever that is, will blame the increase in government spending for the crisis. So they're going to focus on getting government debt down, and that'll have the same effect as I've shown you in Tom Dicaria. You don't want to have that happen. Now, your household debt is high. It's not in the top five in the world, but it's pretty high. And most of your recent increase in debt that's the red line, again, the dark red line there, has been the household sector. You've gone from a level of debt of about 70% of GDP to 100% very rapidly in about seven or eight years, seven years. So that's given you a huge housing bubble. And you've had one going on since uh, the late 1990s as well. So I want to illustrate that. This is the scale of your housing bubble. The red line is house, household debt as a percent of GDP graphed on the left-hand axis. The blue line is the real house price of houses. And from 1994 till now, the house price level has basically quadrupled in real terms. So it's an enormous increase in the cost of housing. Now what causes it? The usual explanation is migration. Much migration to Norway? Okay. People do not buy houses. People with mortgages buy houses. It's the credit system that causes this growth. And I want to show the relationship there. If you, I'll actually, I'll, before I, I'll, I'll talk about it for a sec before I show it to you. People, you, you, they, you. people throw this supply and demand argument at you and then say supply is rigid and it's all the fault of local councils that won't allow enough buildings to be built. That's the usual sort of line you get. They completely forget about the demand side when they say it. But if you think about the flow of demand to buy new houses, how many new houses per year can be purchased given the flow of demand? And what's the flow of supply on the other side? The flow of demand in can basically be regarded as new mortgages divided by the price level. That'll roughly tell you the number of houses per year that can be purchased. So there's a relationship between new mortgages, which is change in mortgage debt, or what I call mortgage credit, divided by the price level. So there's a relationship between new mortgages and the price level. There's therefore a relationship between change in new mortgage and change in the price level. So what actually drives house prices higher is accelerating mortgage debt. And if you could control the financial system to stop accelerating mortgage at happening, you wouldn't have a housing bubble. Now, this is the data for Norway on that front. The red line is the annual is change in the, in the level of mortgage credit per year, of household credit, and the blue is change in the house price index. Now, again, according to the mainstream, that correlation is zero. In your case, it's 0.64. In America's case, it's 0.8. So the real driving force of rising house prices is runaway mortgage credit. And what you've got to do is control mortgage lending to keep house prices under control. And that's where your crisis is going to come from. So demand is going to fall here when, and I think it all may read of start of what I've been told about house prices in Oslo when I arrived uh, a couple of days ago. And if oil prices fall at the same time, it's a double whammy you're going to have to cope with. But you do have your sovereign wealth fund. I suggest you start working out how to use it. Okay, It's there. Don't let the politicians tell you it can't be touched because during a rainy day, they'll say you should leave it until a rainy day. They'll always delay when you should spend the money. Don't let them do that. So you are well placed to counteract what's going to happen using that sovereign wealth fund. But they're going to obsess over government debt instead. So if you can get the message out that that's nonsense and get that out and understood before it happens, hopefully we can stop that political crisis happening here. You don't need austerity on top of a credit crisis. In fact, addressing the credit crisis involves the opposite of austerity. What you do need is to write that private debt off. And I've I don't, I'll talk about it a bit in question time here rather than trying to do it in the presentation because you've been listening to me for the last half hour or so, or maybe even an hour. Um, but you can, we can create, we can cancel, well, there are two ways to create money domestically. Banks do it by lending out more than they get back in repayments. The government does it by running a deficit, spending more than it gets back in taxation, which is quite capable of doing. That government money creation capacity is behind quantitative easing in the rest of the world, where in, in America's case, for example, every year, for pretty much the last six or seven years, the Federal Reserve has been creating a trillion dollars of money and buying financial assets with it. That's what's been driving up the share market, benefiting wealthy people who own the shares. That same capacity could be used to put money into personal bank accounts and can cancel private debt for those who have cancelled debt, uh, who have had debt, 
But for those that don't have that, gives them a cash injection, which could either be money for spending or money to buy shares with, democratise capitalism using that capability, which is quite, quite feasible. <coughs> You've also got to end the possibility of mortgage bubbles. And a major reason why this happens is if you and I are competing over the same property in Trondheim, the one of us who gets more leverage wins. So individually now we are rewarded by getting more debt. But if you change the system to say there's a maximum amount of money that can be borrowed against a house, and that's based on the rental income of the house, and let's say the rental income of the property is, I don't know, say 100,000 kroner a year, then you could say the maximum anybody can borrow, and this could be part of the real estate advertisement, is a million kroner, and therefore if you want to buy the property, you've got to save more of your own money. Okay? So you don't get the positive encouragement to want that high level of leverage. And it also, as I said, you could use the debt jubilee to reverse the rise in inequality because particularly after quantitative easing has created all this money for the wealthy. It's just driven up the cost of shares, which makes them wealthier. We could use the same technology to say, let's give it to everybody and transfer the ownership of those shares or create new shares, which can be used to create, reduce corporate debt as well and have a way of democratising capitalism and get it out of this crisis at the same time. And the other thing I want you to do is help out with rethinking economics here and with the work that I'm doing as well. We need realistic economics. This is not just a, a university game. It's something which affects everybody because unrealistic economics is a bit like having a bunch of Ptolemaic astronomers telling us how to get to Mars. Okay? It's never going to happen. Now, that's a hypothetical. We've got Ptolemaic, what I call Ptolemaic economists telling us how to manage the real economy and making it worse, far worse than it needs to be. So I'm doing my best to fight against it. I've now gone up getting crowdfunding, by the way, to continue doing that because I'll be leaving the academic sector next year for all sorts of reasons. But there's also the Rethinking <coughs> Student Group. Uh, and these, these students are critics of a bad theory of capitalism. They are not necessarily critics of capitalism. This is one thing which was very confusing back in the 60s and 70s when I was involved in these struggles as a student. And there were lots of mad lefties who thought we'd have you know, socialism tomorrow type stuff. I was never one of those. And the ones who are now working in merchant banks in New York. Okay. Uh, but it's no longer critics of capitalism per se, it's critics of a bad theory of capitalism. And we need those critics to develop a realistic theory of capitalism because it may well end by other means before we actually understand it without their works. Thanks very much. That's the Can we have a little pause uh, and uh, meet at the five minutes? Pause? No, no, go for it now. Talk now. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> who, who, bloody who, who, who wants to just continue now? Show your who, hands. Who wants a break? Who wants a break? <laughs> okay. Who doesn't know what they want? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So um, you can just ask questions. Yes. Yeah. To put, up, put up a hand and he'll point. Yeah, yeah. And we will try to, to, to keep an overview. Yeah. Any questions? Can I speak more slowly? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, what could a bank do? Let's say a bank is positioned in this system. How could that bank survive, in a, let's say, profit from it? How could they implement these? And make a profit? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, one of the problems that the, the thing you'd like banks to do is, is to be providing money for big purchases we can't make on our regular income, which are things like houses and cars. Okay. That's an easy to work a form of consumer credit. You want to provide working capital for, for companies so they give money to companies that let them, that give them overdrafts so they can pay their wages and pay their suppliers without needing to go to get a loan every time they run low on their own bank accounts. And you'd, and you'd like them to fund entrepreneurs, give new money to people who've got new ideas but don't have money to put those ideas into existence. The first form they do, but they've done too much of it because they've financed an asset bubble. The second form they've almost stopped doing because providing working capital is a low profit margin system, so they've gone across to what they call, they've basically made it too expensive for large corporations to have lines of credit and they, they now produce um, what they call commercial paper to get the money to pay their bills on a daily basis. But there's, there's a very good reason why they don't fund entrepreneurs, and that is most entrepreneurs lose money. Most go bankrupt. 
So if a bank made a loan right now to an entrepreneur, five out of six of the entrepreneurs they would lend to would lose money if they were lucky. One might make money. Now then in that case they'd lose the debt, they'd lose the money they lent them as with debt as an asset for the five that lost, or they'd get on the six as interest on the on the amount of debt. I'd rather make it possible for banks to do what I call entrepreneurial equity loans. So they make loans to entrepreneurs not having a, a debt charge on the entrepreneur, but having an equity share. It's a bit like venture capital. And then when they did that, they might lose you know, money on five out of the six, but the one that succeeded, they might make 10 or 20 times their money because the value of the equity would rise. So I'd like to have a combination of venture capital and current banking enabling them to create money for entrepreneurs. And that's one way they could be profitable. Good, good question. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question about the uh, government debt or mm -hmm. public debt. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you put in, you know, the municipality debt in. Pardon, municipality debt? Yeah. When you talk about government debt, yeah. is that only state debt or do you include uh, the municipality debt? They're very different because municipality that municipalities don't, don't produce their own money. So a municipality can only spend what it gets back in revenue from people in it. Norwegian municipalities are borrowing money on a quite broad scale. Yeah. So, um, but my question was, did you include that debt? In government debt? I think that's, I'm actually using the Bank of International Settlements database, so I can't actually answer the question accurately. I think most likely it's consolidated government debt. So what they'd be doing is adding together debt of all government sectors. The database I'm using for all those numbers comes from the Bank of International Settlements. It's only been around for the last two years. And it's a freely available data set. And what they've got is they're getting all the central banks in the world to report using the same standards for private debt, household debt, government debt. So I presume it's consolidated government debt. Because it's one, it's one, it's one thing to baptise the quite troubled if you look at Greece, you can see that, um, well, public uh, assets, you know, like harbors, airports, mm -hmm. whatever, uh, they are not sold, they are privatized, mm -hmm. and they are, I don't know, picked up by hedge funds or whatever, mm -hmm. for pennies. Absolutely. Maybe, yeah. And what could, and I, th I guess the same <coughs> thing could, we of course think that, no, no, the state will take care of it, and, you know, but quite a few, municipalities in Norway, they have a lot of debt. Some yeah. have, I think, you know, 120, 30, 50 percent of their, you know, income. Yeah, that's debt of the private banks. Their, their, their yeah. uh, GDP. And at the same time, they have assets like drinking water resources. Mm. They have some hydropower, you know, something. Yeah. And uh, that debt could be sold, in principle. Mm. And uh, then the credit could say, well, if you can't serve a debt. We take the assets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you look at Greece, that is what has happened. Yeah. What could uh, the people in the municipality do, possibly do, to, to change their ownership from, you know, municipality? You, you really have to get the, get the levels of government to operate together because the only part of government that can create money is the federal government because it has a treasury and a central bank. Yeah. And it should adequately fund its councils. And partly why you've got councils borrowing money like that is they're not getting enough funding out of the federal system. And therefore they're going to borrow the money because they can't create this. They're only they're in the same situation as private individuals. Mm -hmm. And therefore if they get into too much of a debt crisis they have to liquidate, sell assets. It's the wrong way to run a private local council. So you need to have much more willingness to the federal system to fund the local councils. But that also means, of course, a lot more political argy-bargy between the two. And of course, the federal system would rather forget about the councils. You know, that's, if the councils go off and do their own thing, and you have politicians who believe their res responsibility is to run balanced budgets, which is unfortunate the state of most politicians, they think they've solved their problem that way. In fact, they're creating problems themselves later, because they shouldn't be trying to balance their books. They should be creating enough money to enable the physical resources you need at the municipality level to be built, which they're not doing. Yeah, absolutely, but also I think that if you have a government that would like to privatise, you know, that type of... That's action, also, yeah. Uh, so what could, um, you know, the people, the community in that municipality possibly do? I'm thinking, well, how can you uh, 
uh, how do you preserve the ownership of assets in such a way that it cannot be, you know, just grabbed by uh, by creditors? Because I don't think the assets are put up as collateral. Yeah. They borrow, they don't. I think I think to some extent you. Yeah. To some extent you. The only you really have to campaign at the national level. You can't really do much locally unless you, for example, make it obvious that anybody who tries to possess a prepossess a, a local government authority um, asset will find their way blocked by the public and make it into something quite political and political and civil disobedience. But you know, which I don't argue against, by the way. Um, done a bit of it myself in my time. Uh, so you, you do need to make it obvious that you will not let those assets get passed on. Um, the trouble is, of course, you know, you, you, the, the real, the only way to make that possible monetarily is for the federal government to provide the money to take over that local council debt and then provide the funds they need, which they can do easily, but they're refusing to do because of this austerity ideology that all politicians have fallen for. But Steve, the trouble. Yeah. a follow-up question. Yeah. I mean, the premise of what you are saying here is that the government in a country with its own currency mm. can create money out of thin air. Yeah. But then you assume that you remove the uh, distinction or the, the so-called independence of the central bank. Mm. Essentially, what you are saying, then you have to have a system where you change the laws in the country so that the treasury, mm. the Department of Finance, can use the central bank mm. and, and say, create money for mm. us because we're going to run a deficit. Yeah. And this is heresy. Yeah, you, yeah it's still, I mean, one of the reasons that politicians were so happy to hand money, money creation control over to the central banks is back when they did it, inflation was rampant and their goal as politicians were putting up interest rates and they got criticised by the public. So the economists came along and said, look, you should hand it over to the experts and say, yes, please, take this off our hands so we don't get the negative of being, you know, lambasted by our... Uh, constituents were putting up interest rates. So that's why they were happy to do it, because but part of the premise was the economists were experts. Now, if they were experts, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Well, you wouldn't be listening anyway. <laughs> so they didn't know what they were doing. And now you've got them trapped in this argument they should be independent, but they've proven that they don't know how to be independent. So with central banks, th this is actually starting to happen, I think, by the way. Central banks are beginning to realise they should be creating the money. I think central banks are actually ahead of treasuries and certainly ahead of politicians in thinking about this, but they're still, the monetary policy communities are still very conservative. It's more the staff that are realising the need to do this. So what I hope is that the central banks will actually start to say, yes, we should be providing the money you want. And, but they also, and I've seen Andy Haldane argue with this, is that we need to have a non-political, a non-partisan committee deciding how much to create. So we're getting there. In that sense, central banks have been part of the problem, but they also, because they really wore the opprobrium for getting the financial crisis wrong, they're also part of the solution. There is another question. Yeah. yeah, just one question before I wrap it up here. Um, you said that uh, transferring, like having the, the central bank or the, the state mm -hmm. just eliminating all private debt. Not, all, not eliminating all, but eliminating a lot. A certain amount, I've written about the 50% of GDP level that was reasonable, which is about one fifth of what you've got right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think that is very likely to happen. Pardon? I don't think that is very likely to happen. Neither do I. No. So, is there, is there uh, any kind of intermediate solution? Because I yeah, there's another solution, it's called World War III. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it'll be fought against the climate. I mean, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but the reason we got out of this, uh, the Great Depression was the Second World War. Okay. The major, if you look particularly the English data, it's quite remarkable. England didn't get into much debt during the Great Depression. It was more America that did that. But because there was such an enormous amount of government spending to fight the Nazis and stop England being invaded and you know, the same in America as well as the Japanese, that huge amount of government spending, nobody said, we can't afford that bomb. Okay. Nobody ever does say that. But during fighting the Second World War, any amount of government spending was fine. There was such a huge level of government spending in one year in 1940, the government deficit in Britain was 40% of GDP. Now, that was necessary because that's what built the Spitfires and the 
you know, the, the, the arms, the boats, etc., etc., that managed to fight off the Germans. So with that a huge amount of money, nobody could spend. Everybody's using the army earning, earning wages they couldn't spend, or on rations back at home working in factories. So there was people just basically put the government money into their bank accounts, both corporate bank accounts and private, and that's the major reason we reduced private debt last time around. Then you look at the American economy, it went from a debt level at the start of the Great Depression of about 120% of GDP. By the end of the Second World War, it was down to 30% of GDP. So that huge fall was just, not because we did it deliberately, it's because we faced an existential threat. And in that situation, all the limits about how much we should spend just disappeared. The government spent that enormous amount of money and that cancelled the debt. So I don't expect us to do it deliberately. I think we'll be fighting climate change if we do that. This is one of those amazing things that people who are too young to experience the inflation in the 80s ring up to me all the time. It shows the extent to which that rosy man scared the pants off people. The main cause of that inflation was the booming economy. The economy was, like my, my own personal experience, when I was a 18 year old in Australia, the unemployment rate was 1%. And the wage rises in, in when I was 20 were 17% across the board. And you had the oil price rises coming in after that as well. So it wasn't government money creation, it was actually quite low at the time. It was the sheer boom the economy was undergoing that gave workers and raw material suppliers huge bargaining power. And as they exerted that, at the same time the private debt bubble crashed. So there was a huge, uh, and for its time, a huge bubble in 1973 to 75. That's what caused that period of both stagnant growth and high inflation. Now we, we then, it's Milton Friedman who sold this whole idea that it was due to government printing money. But if you look at the level of government money creation at the time, it was quite trivial because with this huge booming private sector, their tax revenue was so great, most of them were close running surpluses. So I understand the fear has been ingrained into us by this, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the, I had to use the term, it's the economic holocaust. It's, well, we all remember this theory. We've got the cause of it wrong. And in fact, at the moment, they're trying to cause inflation. And they're failing to cause that inflation. So, but it's still a fear everybody has. Now, a certain amount of inflation would actually be successful in reducing the debt burden right now, but the question is how much inflation? What do you want? You, you have to say that the government, what's been sold to us is the belief the government cannot do this, cannot create money. And well, the reality it can, and it should, but the question is how much? And then you say, you know, are you causing too much inflation? Are you causing a current account deficit? Those sorts of questions. It's really the, the consequences we need to consider, rather than whether whether it can or cannot be done. And what we've solved, what we've solved on, is belief that it can't be done. Yeah. Long-winded answer, but I hope. Hi. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I am an economist. An old economist. Yeah, and besides all the comments about the local economy, which. Uh, the great part of the Norwegian economy, as you said. Mm -hmm. I have two main questions to mm -hmm. you. The one first is probably simple. It's about inflation. How you create that uh, in the model? First, I will say it's very interesting to, to see your dynamic model as mm -hmm. you presented first. Mm -hmm. But I have one, as a second question, fundamental uh, remark about the Norwegian government, how they act with infrastructure, transport, mm -hmm. hospitalization as a in, in detailed input output models, yeah. which give much more interactivity in the economy, which uh, is not uh, satisfactory in your model as you presented it. Yeah, there's other ones where I've got input output dynamics, isn't there? Yeah, that, that's one thing Norway's done. Uh, you know, I know I'm saying you've got a probably a crisis coming away, but I think Norway's done a brilliant job of managing its oil resources compared to other countries like Australia, my own country, but it's done an appalling job of managing its mineral resources. And it has nothing like the industrial infrastructure that you've got or the technological development you've got. So I think Norway's done a brilliant job on that front. 
and partly the awareness of input output dynamics is part of why you had that. So, you know, if you, I think Norway, if you've had a choice between the Australia's crisis and Norway's crisis, I'd take Norway's. Okay. So, and in, in the model I've shown you has no price dynamics in it, but another model I do does have price dynamics. And one of the intriguing things is I, I, I loathe supply and demand thinking. Okay. It drives me barmy. But it's because it's static. They draw supply and demand curves without any relationship to time. And I, I finally got, I, I, when I tried to bring prices into my model, I realised I had to start from a supply and demand perspective. But I had a flow of supply and a flow of demand, so dimension by time. And when I set them equal to each other, I got a price, a marking up a, a, a equation where prices rose if the flow of, flow of demand was greater than the flow of supply and fell otherwise. And it was, the equation was actually identical to what's called Kolesky's markup equation, if you know that. So the ironic thing is, a big battle between neoclassical economics at supply and demand and post-Keynesian economic markup pricing, they're identical in a dynamic framework. I can show you the maths if you like it. I might just see it later. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Okay with you guys. Uh, this is the last question, mm -hmm. and if anyone has someone else to ask Steve about, we can take it yeah, up sure. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, okay, one more question. It sounds for me like you are saying, "Fuck your banks." Rain uh, is coming. It sounds for me like thank you you're bags. <laughs> rain uh, is coming. So I think what is umbrella? What's the umbrella? The umbrella is really not in debt, and, and the. The solution is if you're not in debt and there's a crisis, you've got cash to spend and other people are trying to liquidate assets to raise cash. So that's the negative side. But the positive side, which Trun does a fair bit of work on, is developing parallel currency systems. Because if you have a local parallel currency, and this happened in, in the Second World War, or the, so not the Second World the Great Depression in Austria, a town, what's the town called again? Vergil. Huh? Vergil. Thank you. Created uh, money following the ideas of a guy called Gazelle. Yeah. It's Gazelle's money, where they created their own local script, which is okay to pay council taxes. This is another thing you can do for councils as well. Uh, the parallel payment system rapidly took that economy back to full employment. It was the only part of Austria that burned before the central bank shut them down. They so threatened to put the military. Pardon? They threatened to come with the army if they didn't stop and mm. yeah. start to use uh, the Reich money. Yeah, and that, you know, the, the, Crazy thing, people will defend a failing system against one that's working. So it's first to get out of debt, be in a situation to have cash and others have liabilities they've got to, they've got to meet by selling assets. 
um, and look at parallel currencies. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Pardon? 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 Pardon?